Today, anime is a digital medium. Every year we have projects that push the boundaries of what can be achieved with animation. But it wasn't always computerised, and the adoption of digital animation hasn't been a smooth one. Because of the colossal increase in the quantity of anime after the introduction of digital animation, we have a skewed perspective on how recent its implementation was. Chances are your favourite anime shows were created in the digital era, but its introduction and normalisation isn't as far in the past as you might think. There's a lot of misconceptions. Relative to the lifespan of the medium, digital animation is still a new and unexplored technology. There are a number of events that trigger the digitalization of the medium, and some of my favourite works coincide with these periods. In this video, I'm going to explore when anime turned digital, and how that shaped the medium today, the benefits and the damages. Now, you might date the start of digital animation to the early 2000s, where most studios first implemented computer suites. Or you might even date it back to the 90s, where a number of movies used pioneering digital techniques. But digital animation actually has its roots in the early 80s, 1983 to be exact. This is a special year for two milestones. Firstly, Kajika Monogatari, or The Yearling, a world masterpiece theatre series that composited a whole episode inside a computer, and added various digital effects like beams of light from the sun. Although it maintained a predominantly traditional aesthetic, without any prior knowledge you could watch the series and not even notice any digital input. The second and far more obvious milestone was in Osamu Dezaki's Golgo 13 film. He used digital animation to create the film's opening sequence, and helped with shots of a helicopter and an action scene towards the end. Looking back at this, it looks pretty bad. It hasn't aged well at all. But at the time, this was revolutionary. 3D animation like this had barely been used at all, never mind in an anime film. And by the way, don't let this scene put you off the movie, it's only a fraction of what is actually a fantastic action flick. These projects were done at the Japan Computer Graphics Lab, and we actually have a demo reel from that lab that exists on YouTube. There's a bunch of logos and basic 3D animations, this was from 1984. You can see they were already testing what computers could do with animation. With these projects came the birth of digital animation in anime. Daikon 4 is important to note from this period too. It was an opening sequence for a sci-fi convention by Studio Gainax, and it's become a sort of legend in the industry. A lot of people bookmark Daikon 4 as the turning point for anime, turning into its own medium, the start of a fandom. It used a very short digital sequence, but its importance comes not from that, but from who was involved in it. Gainax becomes one of the most important anime studios after this, and a lot of the audience at the sci-fi conventions were industry workers. These early years were a goldmine of experimentation, not everything came out the other end intact, and most of it is extremely dated now. Regardless, it's an interesting period to look at, and incredibly important to the medium. Although digital animation wasn't all blocky 3D scenes, in fact this becomes one of the big misconceptions about the topic. In 1988, the groundbreaking film Akira showcased a computer system called the Quick Action Recorder in its Making Off documentary. This was a computer system that allowed animators to put together drawn versions of a scene while working, to see how scenes would flow and how the pacing would work. This concept is more well known over here as an animatic. Despite Akira claiming it to be a new technology, the system had been in use in Japan for most of the 80s, and some people actually consider it the first instance of digital animation in anime. This, I imagine, was invaluable to production, saving so much time and resources. The one problem with digital animation in the 80s, and the reason it took a whole decade to really kick off, was the price of hardware. Most studios just didn't have the funding to throw massive amounts of money at technology they didn't quite understand. But that all changed in the 90s, where hardware costs plummeted, and suddenly studios could afford to try out digital animation. We can look at smaller examples that dipped their toes into the water, but it was in 1995 that Mamoru Oshii threw himself into the deep end with his film Ghost in the Shell, quite rightly noted as a pioneering work for digital animation. Fascinated by the new technology, Oshii and his team composited the whole movie with computers, using what's referred to as a non-linear editing suite. Before anime would be made on film, which becomes a very destructive process, a non-linear system doesn't work frame by frame, instead it connects elements like 3D scenes, layers and effects together. This was revolutionary in how anime could be developed, hours and hours of precious time could be saved with absolutely no quality loss. Specifically, digital effects like computer systems or dynamic text could be created in seconds. The iconic opening typography sequence, for example, would have taken months to animate by hand, but with the digital process, it could be completed in a fraction of the time, allowing them to do cool things like making those numbers the binary code for each staff member's name. Lens effects like the distortion on the edge of the frame here could easily be made without having to animate each frame. This allowed them to replicate real cameras with ease. 
You can see how sequences like these could only be possible with the help of computer animation. This made Ghost in the Shell one of the most intricate and progressive films in the medium. It was using techniques that nobody had seen before in almost every scene. This revolutionary jump became a main influence on the thematic content of the film too. Oshii was always interested in how technology and computers will enhance our lives, and he was at the heart of one of those revolutions with digital animation. He used his experiences with the new technology to guide the film's story. Ghost in the Shell grows a meta-narrative in this sense. Although the film had become a successful digital anime, it still wasn't an industry standard. Prices would have to drop considerably before more studios could invest in the technology and a lot of studios weren't all convinced about the movement to digital. Anime at this point was a very traditional medium, and the people who controlled it were happy with it staying that way. So the 90s became a testing ground for various studios trying out computer animation. A few years later, the TV production Gal Gygar used various digital elements throughout its episodes. The team would create CG elements for the show, and would add them into the series throughout each episode allowing them to have complex animation throughout the series with little effort. The idea of sprinkling digital effects into traditional animation became the standard, with bigger projects like Escafloni compositing digital artefacts into a very traditional aesthetic. But some studios were taking extra steps to digitalise their projects. Alice was released at the very end of the decade and became the very first fully CG anime film. It's a real artefact of 90s computer animation. Very few studios had the courage to produce full projects like this because of the judgmental anime audience. And looking at Alice, I'm not surprised. Obviously there was a whole new level of freedom in how they could frame shots. Moving a digital camera around a 3D environment was easy, and action scenes could pull off complex choreography. But elements like textures and visual effects were years from what they needed to be. Characters just didn't blend with the backgrounds, and facial expressions seemed robotic. This project as a standalone piece of anime wasn't great, but it's an example of the possibilities computer animation could unlock. One of the compromises of this period was called cell shading. This used computers to take advantage of all the time-saving benefits, but imitated traditional cell animation. A lot of the time, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. One of the early examples of this idea was at Studio Ghibli. Miyazaki has always been a fan of the traditional animation process, but even he couldn't resist the benefits of computers. After experiments in Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away in 2001 became their first film to be composited fully in a computer. This increased the studio's productivity immensely, having the film completed in just 18 months. But Miyazaki took extra care to almost trick the audience into thinking otherwise. He even added in artificial movement into static objects to replicate traditional cell animation. This says a lot about how the industry was looking at the new technology. They were eager to embrace the new era of computer animation, but unlike Disney or DreamWorks, they were reluctant to give away the old aesthetic. Katsuhiro Otomo was one of the early innovators in this field with his film Steam Boy in 2004, using a handful of digital techniques to enhance its production. Although Otomo has voiced his concerns about the new technology, he discussed in a 1998 interview in Animage that with the explosive amount of new options, animators can get distracted from the basics. Despite his concerns, Otomo embraced digital animation for Steam Boy and created some of the most intricate animation I've ever seen. It not only excelled in creating amazingly complex scenes with 2D animation, it utilised 3D animation in a way that had never been done before. The production team would storyboard traditionally, then create a basic 3D version of the scene, and then animate over that to produce the final concept. Much like how Akira used the quick action recorder to create an animatic, this allowed them to produce camera movements that 2D animation would never be able to without sacrificing detail. Although this obviously wasn't a realistic standard, as only a handful of projects since have been able to use these techniques successfully. Outside of using computers to recreate a traditional look, some studios were dipping their toes back into the idea of rotoscoping. This had been used throughout the years, even going as far back as 1958 with Haku Jaden that filmed live action sequences for referencing an animation. With the help of computers, studios could use motion capture to enhance movement. In traditional pieces, this ended up looking out of place, falling into the uncanny valley, but it became an opportunity for CG movies. In 2001, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within was released. The film lost millions due to its poor box office performance, but visually, it was one of the most advanced pieces of CG animation in the industry. And to be honest, it still holds up today. Character models were extremely realistic, and everything blended together quite nicely. It's certainly not perfect, but the CG was viable for creating a good movie, if in the right hands. A huge improvement on Alice. Unfortunately, the massive amount of money Spirits Within took to make meant CG films wouldn't be making a regular appearance. 
A few years later in 2004, Appleseed was released. This improved visually again with some of my favourite CG action scenes, and the world was presented seamlessly with fantastic detail. But the bottom line was that these movies were never going to make money, they took far too much capital to produce and the market just wasn't accepting them. Unlike Disney and DreamWorks who were making CG movies some of the most successful box office releases ever, if two already established franchises, Final Fantasy and Appleseed couldn't make it work, then who could? But something far more important was happening. In the year 2000, a young Makoto Shinkai having just left the video game industry was working on a solo project. He took on the task of writing, directing and producing his very own short film, Voices of a Distant Star. Shinkai created it all on his computer, using software like Photoshop and After Effects. He didn't have a production team or a studio, in fact he didn't even have voiceovers. Him and his wife initially played the two characters. It took seven months to create and became the catalyst to a new way of thinking in the industry. By this time every studio had a computer suite, and as Shinkai proved in 2001, animation was now limitless. Anyone with talent and dedication could now produce high quality animation. This leads to us now, the current digital era. Around this time, the amount of anime being produced every year skyrocketed, and niche projects that previously wouldn't have found funding now have audiences in the thousands. Studios like Science Saru were being founded with small teams using accessible software to create complex works. We're living in a really interesting age and it's only just starting. With organisations like Netflix now funding full series, there seems to be no limits to what might come next. And it's all thanks to the pioneering work of the individuals involved in anime. Reluctant to let go of the anime aesthetic, the industry has used digital animation to keep anime, well, anime. And I think that's one of the main reasons that we love the medium. And I can't wait to see what the coming years have in store for us. I'm going to make another video soon exploring the new landscape of digital animation. But for now, I hope this has been a helpful overview of when anime went digital. So thank you to all my subscribers for watching this video and for the continued support on all my projects lately. I've really been putting in the hours and I'm making some of my all time favourite videos. And that's not stopping anytime soon, so thanks for watching. Be sure to share the video around if you can and make sure you're subscribed. I'm also on social media if you want more regular updates. But for now, Thanks for watching.